This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by the Deck of Many and their amazing Big Bad Booklet series. This booklet is a monthly release that includes all the information, lore, imagery, and stat blocks that you need to run an epic boss monster in 5th edition. Available as both a digital print and play and in hard copy, this month's release features the God of Kings, a terrible entity in prison in a stone prison for their attempt to try to take over the Divine Pantheon. Every monthly release has a print and play PDF and all the reference cards that you need to role play and run an incredible epic boss battle at your game table. So check it out in the description below or head to bigbadbooklet.com to sign up now. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Now, Kelly and I have been DMing for many years, but I often think back in horror to my first campaign. <laughs> Where I made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. As we're winding down for the year, it's a good time for introspection and looking back at the past. And when we look back at the past, we can see all of the glaring issues that happened during our initial stint in being DMs. So today we're going to discuss five awful mistakes that Kelly and I made in our very first D&D campaigns. Uh, and talk about what we learned from them and how you, as a new first-time Dungeon Master, might avoid making those mistakes. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So my Dungeons & Dragons story begins back in the early 2000s when 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons was first launched. I went into my favorite fantasy and science fiction bookstore and the owner of that shop told me that I should check out this box set that just came in and pick it up. I just got my first summer job, so I picked up my three core rule books in that first box set and introduced a bunch of my high school friends. I was creatively ambitious as a young kid, and I wanted to run my own campaign world. I immediately set out to design my own world that involved my favorite elements from Rome, ancient Rome, feudal Japan, all sorts of different worlds that were all smashed together, and a horrible plotline involving a pet NPC wizard that bossed the entire party around. My campaign was a disaster. My players had a wonderful time, but the game ultimately imploded because I didn't know where things were going and I had to stop the campaign because I really didn't know how to string the entire plot together. I was caught up with all the world building and campaign planning and all these sorts of things. And that was when the good bookstore owner said to me, hey, why don't you pick up this copy of Dungeon Magazine and run one of the adventures in it? And all of a sudden, everything clicked. For myself, I got into D&D thanks to Monty, and he ran a wonderful campaign for me and several friends. From this experience, I realized that I too wanted to be a DM because I enjoyed telling stories. And I started thinking while playing about the wonderful worlds that I could create. And so when I set out, I did something very similar and I decided none of these pre-written modules are exactly what I have in mind. So I tried to make a vast pirate campaign spanning an entire world with ship combat before there was much rules for ship combat. I tried to have these 12 keys that they had to find to unlock an ancient treasure. And I had an 80 page document and it got to a point where a few months in, my head felt like it was exploding. I had mm. too much content and didn't know how to handle it all. And that's when I decided that maybe it was a good idea. I was getting way ahead of myself. It was too much of a burden. And I picked up Tyranny of Dragons and decided, what if I just ran the module that was available for 5th edition D&D and felt what it was like to run something that somebody else had written? Begrudgingly, I jumped into it, but by the end of it, there was a lot of value in that lesson. Running a published adventure showed me the ropes and let me focus on what was really important, which was running the adventure at the table. It saved me tons of time on campaign planning. I still did a lot of it because I still homebrewed and customized those adventures, but I had an existing structure and it was very easy to see, oh, this is where the campaign is going. This is where it's building up to. And I think reflecting for both you and I, I think the biggest gap that we ran into is that 
As a new dungeon master, you get really excited about how to start. And I'm almost certain as a new DM, you have this epic conclusion in your mind of like the great villain in the final showdown. But where the whole thing falls apart is right in the middle. <laughs> now, what we're trying to say here is not don't homebrew if you're just getting started. All of us have an imagination and we are excited to play D&D for the reason of exploring our own imagination. But what was great is even if you're jumping in and you have a great homebrew campaign, I still recommend running one of the shorter modules, something like Lost Mine mm -hmm. of Vendelver from the starter set or the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak from the Essentials Kit. Either of these are a great starting point where you can just run a few levels, see how a campaign is structured, add your own flourishes and em embellishes to the story that's being told, and in that you start to learn not only how to homebrew properly, but also how to structure and build a campaign, what is necessary and what is not necessary. We often learn through imitation. That's a great way how human beings teach each other and how we learn. We give each other structures and frameworks. You have your scales that you practice on the piano. As an artist, you'll practice sketching a friend or a family member. That's what a published adventure is for a new dungeon master. It's that beginning steps that shows you, okay, here's how everything feels so you can get the practice in. And then once you've run that short adventure, and I think Lost Minds of Fandalver is perfect because the, the really big thing I think that is the pitfall that both you and I ran into is we were thinking of running a level 1 to 20 campaign. And that's really hard for a new dungeon master, particularly. It's also really hard when you're introducing new players and creating a new social dynamic as well. And so it's often not just the dungeon master that loses it in the middle. It's the players. Running a short campaign, running a short published adventure like Lost Minds that goes from level 1 to 5 is what I should have done. It was like, wow, this game makes sense to me. Now I feel confident as a dungeon master. It gave me the confidence that I knew what I was doing. So if you're a brand new DM setting out to run your first game of Dungeons & Dragons, we recommend looking at the published modules, a short one or a long one that you can learn to explore and learn from about the structure and the fundamental elements that make up a campaign of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, once you have picked your published module and start telling your friends that you're interested in running a game of Dungeons and Dragons, you might have a similar experience to what I had. I told my friend Jesse that I was going to run D&D, who told another friend, who told another friend, who told another friend. And when game night finally came around, I had a table of eight players sitting around my table. And that was really intimidating. Not only were these eight teenagers with all their various teenage proclivities and social drama and baggage brought along with that. Everyone was really excited and super jazzed up and people bought, brought snacks and sugary drinks and other substances. And before I knew it, the game was utter chaos. There were eight people who were talking over each other. I had to yell at people to get them to shut up so that I could speak. It was never clear whose turn it was. Everyone was jumping in over top of each other. People were excited legitimately and it was fun, but it kind of felt like a party. One thing that's hard with Dungeons and Dragons is that yes, you are inviting your friends over for a night of getting together and having fun. But there is also a certain level of respect that comes with a game of D&D &D where you are playing a game, it is a storytelling medium, and you are there to have fun within a narrative being presented by the dungeon master. And there's a fine line there between just having fun with your friends and having fun playing D&D &D with your friends. I also had a hard time running eight players at my mm -hmm. table. Again, the people far at the back of the table were busy having their own conversation, somebody was on their phone, People were taking a long time for turns, which then made it seem fair that the person who waited 40 minutes to get to their turn was on their phone and not paying attention because they had to wait so long. These are common pitfalls of large groups at the table. I've heard a lot of great success stories about people running large groups, but when I got started, I feel like I would have grasped the game faster and been able to dive into the nuances of what Dungeons & Dragons is by having a smaller party. Once you move into those upper numbers of eight, nine, or 10 players, 
you now need to account for the fact that this is going to be a hangout session with a lot of people that are there and excited to see each other, excited to engage with each other outside of the Dungeons & Dragons game. This happens with three to four players as well, but it takes less time for you to be able to crack the whip and say, let's get to the game. There's a lot of strategies and great ways to make running a game with a larger group more efficient. But at the end of the day, you still have eight, nine people sitting around a table over four hours. When you divide that time evenly amongst nine people, that means that each individual person plays less time than if you divided it evenly amongst four or five people. It's just simple math of how the hours break down. A smaller group is generally almost always going to be more engaged with the game of Dungeons and Dragons because the amount of time passing from one player's turn to the next will always be smaller and each player gets to spend more time in the spotlight individually. You can't get around that fact with a larger group. Each player gets less time that they're the star of the show with a bigger group. And so that focus that you get with a smaller group is really, really helpful. And it saves you as a dungeon master the chore of the social dynamic. Because so often the dungeon master is looked to to be the organizer and the leader of the entire social dynamic of the game. P typically this involves scheduling as well and scheduling with a group of nine people can be an absolute nightmare and you're going to run into that situation where so and so can't make it and now they need to get caught up and you end up in all these problems it's all mitigated by having a smaller group so while it might be tempting to want to include every single one of your friends in this awesome game and it's really hard to leave people out i do recommend that you choose carefully who you invite and if you can't invite everybody, maybe split the group up into smaller chunks rather than have everybody all together on one night. The next thing that Monty and I both did when we were setting out to run our first D&D games is we gathered our friends together, we asked them to make characters, they showed up, we sat them down, and we started rolling dice. There was never a conversation about what we were expecting from the game, what each person was hoping to achieve, a little bit of background on their characters, maybe how they would interact with each other. These are all aspects that are part of what we call a session zero. And neither Monty or I had a session zero for our first games. We still had character creation sessions where we went over the basic rules and the basic ideas. But session zero is different from making characters. Session zero is where you set the right expectations and make sure that everyone is interested in playing the game, the same game. Once I played Dungeons and Dragons for a couple years and moved to a larger city, I joined a new D&D group with players that I'd never played with before. And I was shocked to realize just how different everyone's play styles were and how everyone wanted something really different for the game. It's true that setting expectations alleviates a lot of conflict. If everybody around the table has the right expectations and you're all on the same page, it makes a much smoother game. And this is the purpose of a session zero. So if you are jumping into a game of D&D, talk to the players, have a conversation about what everybody wants from it. What is everybody most excited about? I remember this great thing that you did when we were setting out to start a brand new campaign. It was our first one together and you kind of just asked everybody at the table, what's something you want to do in Dungeons and Dragons? It was really simple answers. Like somebody said, I want to get crazy powerful magic items. And another person <laughs> said, I want to fight a dragon. Someone and said, I want to be a god. I want to fight a god. Yeah. And, and that really informs what the interests of, of your group are. If you're setting out with your campaign to run a high political intrigue campaign with lots of role playing and lots of mendacity and spying and subtlety, and you got a bunch of players that just want to kick down the door and kick some ass and throw around some super powerful spells and totally live that power fantasy, you've got something to sort out in your group. <laughs> It can be really challenging when the dungeon master has an idea on the type of campaign that they want to play and they end up with a table of players who have very different ideas of how they want to play D&D. D&D is a beautiful game that leaves a lot of room for variation and interpretation. 
Everybody's home game is different. Every time that somebody runs a module, it's different than somebody else running the same module. There are infinite possibilities within the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. So to get a group of people on the same page is of utmost importance, because if you don't, the variations are endless. Dungeons and Dragons is about having a fun and enjoyable time with your friends. But people have fun in different ways, and not everybody finds the same things fun and entertaining. You need to know this to play D&D together. One of the other things that your players are probably going to do during Session Zero, or as they're making their characters, is they're going to make a backstory about their characters. It's going to tell them their hopes and dreams and where their characters came from. I had a player that wrote a 21-page backstory for his uh, character once. And I didn't read it. <laughs> and I had other players that didn't even bother making a backstory for their characters at all. And I didn't bother. It really didn't matter what their backstory was. It didn't play into the campaign at all. And I basically just ignored their character backstories and ran the campaign that I wanted to run. And that was a mistake. There were some really cool ideas in those characters. And... As the campaign was falling apart, I started to realize just how cool the characters my players had made were and just how interesting their stories could have become. What's really important here is that Dungeons & Dragons is a shared storytelling medium. The Dungeon Master is laying out the story of what is currently happening, but every person who comes to play D&D has an idea on the character they created and the story that they wish to tell with that character. All of us imagine our character as the main character in the story, which means technically you have a table full of main characters. So balancing what each character wants and talking to your players about their imagined stories for, their, for the characters that they've created can actually fuel the campaign that you are about to run. You could be running a homebrew setting, or you could be running a pre-written module that either way has a story that it's going to tell. But by talking to your players, collaborating with them, understanding their backstories, and maybe not get them to write a 21-page backstory, but if they write a few paragraphs of where they came from and what their goals and aspirations are, you can weave that into the tale that you're going to tell. And something that we've actually taken a while to learn, I would say, is how important this mm. is. The more you integrate your players, the better the game feels for everybody. The revelation for me came with my aforementioned player who wrote the 21-page backstory. When I finally got around to reading it, you know, his, he had the standard story of my family was murdered and I want revenge. And... He didn't really know what had happened to his entire family, and we actually had a new player that joined the campaign. And I had that player, sat down with him, and he didn't know what to play. So he ended up playing the brother of the previous character who had turned out to have survived. And then the campaign became about two brothers whose family was murdered horrifically, who got a bunch of friends together to get revenge. And I had this whole other plot line that I planned, and I was just like, no, the campaign about these two brothers is way cooler than anything I could have possibly come up with, and the players were way more engaged for that very reason. It's, it's just called Two Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I can also tell you from a player's perspective, having created a character, writing out a backstory that had gaps in it, and this is actually something that I'm very purposefully doing as a player, is writing a backstory where I don't know what happened to this family member, or I'm not sure where this could come up later. And by having those loose hooks for Monty to pick up on, what ends up happening is when Monty does deliver on them as the dungeon master, I feel so satisfied as a player that my character suddenly feels the most important thing in the setting. My story is coming to life. I get to live that out. Already doing the work to make sure that the players were integrated and that there was a collaborative effort to make it important. And the collaboration is key. Engaging with your players through session zero and putting everything on the table, saying, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I imagine. You don't have to reveal your cards as a dungeon master. You gotta have lots of secrets in store and lots of surprises for your players. But by collaborating with your players and sometimes asking them to make revisions to their backstory so that you can create a more interesting storytelling opportunity 
will create a much more engaging and magical experience. The world of your campaign might not revolve around the player characters, but your players are the stars of your campaign. The campaign is about them. And so that's why collaborating with them, listening to them, delivering on these experiences is really, really important. And when you collaborate with your players, the most important thing is knowing about their expectations. D&D can be more than just having fun. D&D can be about role playing and experiencing what it's like to be another person and to experience actually things in life that aren't fun to experience. Loss, losing family members, getting revenge. These things can happen, but you have to collaborate with each other, you have to listen to each other, and you gotta trust each other. And then the campaign is more about just having fun and making fart jokes. You can have a real cool experience. I think what's important to state here is that these lessons may not apply to everybody, but in some way, shape, or form, there are valuable items within these lessons that we have picked up because we made all of these mistakes. <laughs> and we continue to make mistakes and learn from them. And that is another important point. And this is one of the fundamental rules of D&D &D that you need to know as a brand new dungeon master setting out to encapsulate this wonderful game with your friends into something that you're going to enjoy at the table. And that is that you're going to make mistakes too. Your players are going to make mistakes. You're going to get rules wrong. You're going to push things in the wrong direction and have to reiterate or change things on the fly. And that's fine. When I started dungeon mastering, I thought everything had to be perfect. I thought that my story had to be something that was worthy of a Pulitzer Prize or an Oscar. I thought I had to have this immaculate experience for my players. And anytime I made a mistake, I was like, they hate me now. They hate me, they don't trust me, they never want to play Dungeons and Dragons with me again. Someone is going to come from Wizard of the Coast and take my books away and beat me up. Nobody's going to take your books away, nobody's going to beat you up. Yeah, sometimes you might disappoint your friends. Sometimes they might get upset with you. You have to be accountable when you make a mistake and apologize. You have to be big enough as a dungeon master to be able to admit when you've made a mistake. And take feedback with grace. Knowing that you will make mistakes, knowing that it won't be perfect, but it will still be good, is a really important lesson to internalize. And it's not just about your campaign planning. It's about running the session. But you know what? It doesn't matter because we have a great time and we tell an interesting story that has great emotional stakes. And yeah, you can come back and smooth out some of those mistakes later. That's part of the organic magic of running D&D. You're not going to be completely original. Don't worry about leaning on tropes or cliches. The fact is that that's going to make up majority of your D&D games. And the great idea is you get to see what happens if you play those out. So rely on those and lean into those. And don't be afraid if your story goes off the rails because it's probably going to. Don't be afraid if you got the rules wrong. My best advice is if you messed up the rules and you made a ruling at the table that afterwards you look in the book and say, oh, I didn't run that right. At the next game, just inform your players, hey, I ran that incorrectly last time. Here's the way that the rules actually work. So we're gonna use it this way going forward. We do this all the time, even in Drakenheim. If we mess up a rule, um, we just announce, hey, I messed it up and we continue moving forward. Your players are going to mess up their characters rules. You're going to mess up your DM rules and you just need to be okay with that. We're all going to make mistakes and there's a lot of rules to talk about in Dungeons and Dragons. And my best advice is just go with the flow and do what feels the most correct in the moment and then adjust it afterwards to make sure that you're broadcasting. Hey, we messed up but we're going to be okay moving forward. Here are the rules. Good preparation, research, reading the rules will help you avoid some mistakes, but not all of them. And ultimately, there are some mistakes that you have to experience them for yourself in order to learn the lessons. And that really comes full circle, I think, to our, our full advice, is that running a published campaign, having a session zero, and having a small group of players is gonna give you that environment where you can make mistakes and learn from them. Better than anything else, I think. 
And if I was going to give that playbook of like get together four friends, run Lost Minds of Foundalver, and reflect on your experiences through those sessions, don't be afraid to make those mistakes. You're, you, that is probably the best way to learn how to be a GM. And looking back, I'm glad I made all the mistakes that I did. But that kind of experience probably would have set me better up for success and I would have been running better campaigns sooner, <laughs> right? It, it was like a good six, seven years of playing D&D before I finished a campaign. <laughs> Every experience that I've had running a pre-written module with my group of four or five friends has taught me more and more about the game. And I have found that in the experiences when I was first jumping in and trying to overload my D&D game with my own ideas and with eight players and without running a session zero and just diving into this crazy pirate world I made, it didn't work. And it ended up crashing and burning. And yes, there were lessons along the way. But I think this idea of learning from our mistakes and setting yourself up for an easy, almost trial run at D&D where you get to The tutorial level. Yeah. <laughs> This is the tutorial level, and it's valuable. If you have experience in role-playing games, and this isn't your first forte, then maybe you don't need this advice. But if you're just picking up your starter set or um, your essentials kit, then you might want to take this advice and just grab a few friends, learn the ins and outs of the game, and get ready to jump into the bigger world that is Dungeons & Dragons. Your game doesn't need to be the best game ever. It just needs to be better than the game that you ran last week. Improve over time. And always remember, the best campaigns are always the ones in the future. Learn from your mistakes. Give yourself the time and opportunity to make those mistakes. Because you're going to be playing Dungeons & Dragons, hopefully with great friends, for years and years to come. And every adventure will always be more exciting and rewarding than the last one. So this has been a look at five awful mistakes that we made when we started running Dungeons & Dragons. If you've made some awful mistakes yourself and you think they're valuable lessons to learn, tell us about them in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity and support of our patrons. If you enjoy the work that we create here on YouTube, Twitch, and elsewhere, please consider becoming one of our patrons by following the links in the descriptions below. If you are a fan of our work, you might be interested to hear that we are creating a book for 2021. We've partnered with Ghostfire Games to kickstart our live play campaign into an adventure module for 5th edition. If you haven't heard of our live play, it's Dungeons of Drakenheim, and we're now in Season 2, Shadows of Drakenheim. You can check out our live play at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. It airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. Or you can find all the previous episodes of that campaign right up over here. And if you want to hear about all the other rules, mistakes that you can make in Dungeons & Dragons and how to avoid or fix them, we've got plenty more videos with DM advice right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.